Welcome to Dateline Democracy. My name is Peter Roussel, and at Sam Houston State University, I fulfill the Philip G. Warner Endowed Chair in the Department of Mass Communication. Dateline Democracy is an independent class of students uh, in conjunction with the 2020 presidential election who will be meeting with top national media uh, individuals and photographers uh, and visiting with them and asking them questions about the 2020 presidential campaign, about their careers, and about other issues and getting insights and perspectives about their lives and their careers. Uh, this is all under the sponsorship of the College of Arts and Media and the Department of Mass Communication at Sam Houston State University, and in conjunction with the Department of Political Science there. I would like to make just one final personal comment before we get on with the program, and it's this. I have known today's guest, Leslie Stahl, and worked with her in various venues around the world, and certainly in the White House. I've known and worked with her since 1974. That's 1974, folks. <laughs> Don't add it up. <laughs> I subtract. And, well, all I would add to that is right now I can sit here and look right into this camera without the slightest hesitation and with utter conviction and say that in my view, Leslie Stahl is at the very top of her profession, the very top. I will now turn it over to my co-host, clinical professor of of political science at Sam Houston State University, Professor Mike Yon. Thanks, Peter. And while I don't know Mrs. Stahl, I do know her work because the work and the stories she has covered are the story of the United States over the last 50 years, from Vietnam and Watergate to Camp David to the Cold War in Berlin to Iraq, Monica Lewinsky, Iraq again. Afghanistan, the Affordable Care Act, the Great Recession, and the age of Donald Trump. From the three networks to Twitter, to the age of Twitter, Ms. Stahl has covered it all, won an Emmy in the process, and appeared on Frasier. <laughs> Welcome here today. We're going to start with some questions primarily from Peter, and then we will turn it over to the students. And the students' questions may be a, a little bit um, duplicative from our conversation. Uh, so feel free to sort of ad lib as you see fit as we go through this. And, and keep in mind that our goal is to educate the public and the students as best as possible. So no, no answer is off topic. Peter, what do you have for us today? <laughs> well, this is a real treat for me to be visiting with Leslie again. It's, it's been some time. Um, but there's just two things I want to mention, Leslie, before we get to the questions. And the first thing is, I'm sure you have no idea of the first time that our paths crossed. I know you, you can't remember the moment, but it was actually in 1974, mm -hmm. and you were covering the Watergate story. So mm -hmm. this would have been like spring, I'm going to say it was spring of 74, and I was working for George Bush is his press secretary when he was chairman of the Republican National Committee. And one day we were walking into the front of the building and here you came with a film crew and ran up and started asking him some questions and so forth. So that was actually the first time uh, we actually met. And uh, now, I was remembering because I'm reading a book about James Baker, who was his best friend. And uh, I, I was remembering a moment when I did go to see him at the Republican National Committee headquarters. And I had a story that was not very flattering to him. Do you remember this at all? And I was going to put it on the evening news with Walter Cronkite that night. And he called me on the phone and he said, you'd be making a big mistake if you run that story because it's not true. And I listened to him. And I didn't run the story because I believed him. And he, <laughs> he I, I know that he hadn't had that kind of experience too often with reporters. Uh, and so we had, a, we had a lovely relationship after that. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about it just the other day and it may have been the very day 
that you and I met for the first time. That, that may have been. In fact, he asked me that day after we went inside the building, he, he said, I want you to call Leslie Stahl and talk to her about that. So I, I, th I thought, why me, you know? Then, then I realized <laughs> it was my job. You put him on the phone, I think. You must have. Well, so I, I did call you later. And uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think maybe I finally just handed the phone to him. And y'all went, went from there. Right. And I do remember that day very vividly. And I'm writing my memoir right now. So I'm going to have that in there. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you a second time that you, you, this was a very fleeting moment, but you'll never know what impact it had on me. And that is flash forward uh, seven years after that to 1981. And Jim Baker just asked me to come back, or to come into the Reagan White House because Jim Brady had been seriously wounded in the assassination attempt on President Reagan. So here I came again for my second tour of duty in the White House. And the first day I was walking in the Northwest Gate there and walking up the North Lawn and I looked out on the lawn and you were the only person out there doing a stand-up. I said, gosh, Leslie must have everybody beat today. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, we were about, you know how it is there. We were about 50 yards apart, but you turned around and you saw me coming and you stopped and you yelled at me and you said, <laughs> you said, hey, Pete, <laughs> you did. You said, hey, Pete, welcome back to the White House. Oh. And you know, I thought at that moment, I thought, you know, that's kind of neat. I appreciate her, Leslie saying that to me because it makes me feel like I should be here because I'm going to be working with people that I know and, and respect. And uh, that, that was a fleeting moment, but it kind of said something to me. And so I appreciate it at the time. I never told you that. But. No, but I, this is the era when I remember you. <laughs> this is the era when, uh, when you and I really did come into contact. Have you noticed already up there, everybody called me Pete and down here, everybody calls me Peter. Oh, really? Well, he's Pete to me. Sorry. <laughs> uh, okay. On, on with the program here. And the first thing I would like to ask you is we, all of us here, are affiliated with Sam Houston State University, a mm -hmm. tremendous uh, institution of learning in Huntsville, Texas. And it is the alma mater of your longtime colleague and friend, Dan Rather. And Dan comes down here periodically. He's done so much for this university. And as a matter of fact, I teach in the building that bears his name. Um, so I wanted to ask you, do you have anything you'd like to say about Dan or any comments or any anecdotes? Because you know, he's a great storyteller. I'll say, first let me say that it is also the alma mater of my mother-in-law. Ha ha, because you know, my wow. husband's a Texan. He's yes. from Spur, Texas. A lot Aaron, of Texans, Aaron Latham. Right. A lot of Texans haven't even heard of Spur, Texas. Forget the rest of the country. But she went to your school. So that's my real connection. Leslie, what was her name? Alayuna. I guess she would have been Cosby back then. Uh, I think with a Z. C-O-Z-B-Y. That was her maiden name. I, you know, my husband's here. I should ask him. But anyway. Approximately uh, what year? Oh my gosh, don't ask me, you know. <laughs> you know, Pete's basically told you how, how old I am, so you have to go back. We might have a year. Three years before oh, that. If it makes you feel any better, Leslie, you and I are the, are the exact same age. Well, I don't want, you keep talking about it. I think we should just get on with what's at hand. So Dan Rather, let's get, uh, let me talk about Dan for a minute. Um, when you say Dan, my mind goes right back to the first time I met him and knew him, which was in 1972 when I first joined CBS. And he was the White House correspondent. Uh, and Nixon was the president. And they had a terrible relationship, the two of them. They would go at each other. Uh, and I thought Dan Rather was the bravest, um, most honest, reporter, I wanted to be like Dan Rather. And then I got to know him as a friend, and he was also a lovely person to know away from being the tough guy at the White House. He was cordial always to everybody. Uh, you wouldn't hear a person say a bad thing about Dan Rather back then, except maybe Richard Nixon. 
uh, he, he became somewhat of a lightning rod, as I remember, for sort of the conservative wing of the Republican Party. And George Bush, uh, Herbert Walker George Bush, when he ran for president, he kind of keyed on Dan all those years later after Watergate. Uh, so in many ways, because he was so courageous, uh, I think he's a hero to a lot of people in journalism who are younger than I am, you know, and uh, and my generation as well. Well, that's that, that's a very nice commentary, and uh, I think you know that speaks volumes about Dan. Uh, I'll tell you just one last thing, and then I'm going to kick it back to Mike so we can start the questions. But and it says goes to what you just said about him <clears throat> when he comes down here, he. Every time I see him and we, we start visiting, the first thing he says to me, it's not about him and it's not about me and our careers or any of that. He, Dan used, when my father was a drama critic for 33 years for the Houston Post, and when Dan was growing up in Houston, he used to read his column. And the first thing he always says to me is, Peter, uh, I was, a, I followed your father's column and he was a great writer and so forth. And I really appreciated him yeah. bringing that up. I'll tell he you, doesn't, he doesn't have to do that, but he did. My husband was a, a reporter back in those days and he was in uh, Iran and disappeared, completely disappeared off the face of the earth. And everybody I knew was frantically looking for him. I never even said anything to Dan rather. I never said a word to him. He called up somebody who was, I think, maybe with the CIA, I don't know, somebody in Tehran and called in a chit. He asked this guy if he would go and find Aaron Latham, and he did. He wow. found him. My husband was in a hospital. And he I've never him. heard that story. Dan, Dan just took it upon himself to ask someone he knew a favor to find my husband. So, you know. That's a great ending to it. Stand up person. Yep, yep. Okay, well listen, Mike, it's yours. Leslie, just to, to tie one more thing back, you brought up James Baker and his family's also from Huntsville. So his grandfather or great grandfather, I can never get that right, is buried here and he's the one who founded Rice University. I know that because I'm reading this fantastic book. It's so good, it is just delicious about James Baker and his family. So it goes way back. Is, was he his great grandfather? I think I, he was his great grandfather. I think that's right, but it's confusing because he's James Baker the third, but it's actually his great grandfather who was the, the first. And so it, it is a little bit confusing, but um, it's a, it that. is a great book that, that, that one by Peter Baker and Susan Glasser. Yes. yes. I'm, 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 I'm halfway well. through. Well, I have one question before I kind of segue into the students, but um, you really came of age when the, the founding fathers of television were, were on their way out, and that's captured in the movie Network. <clears throat> have you seen that movie, and, and was that kind of an accurate portrayal of how the early days of television was segueing into what we see now as kind of a weird reality television type environment? Um, I was actually there, not when they were going out, but in the golden age, when Walter Cronkite was the most re respected man in, in the country, uh, and just set CBS, or actually Edward R. Morrow had established the standards and the tone of CBS News, and Walter took it over and just perpetuated it and made us the place to come to for, for news you can trust. News you can trust, everybody in the country believed what we were saying. I know your students are not gonna believe that everybody in the country believed what reporters were saying, but it really was the golden age. And we took ourselves to be the New York Times of, of broadcast television. And the New York Times was greatly respected in those days too. And we did tell the truth and we were under, I don't know if your students know this, but there was something called the Fairness Doctrine. We were obliged to be fair and balanced. And we always presented two sides to every argument, always. People didn't argue, they actually conversed, had conversations. 
uh, the doctrine, the fairness doctrine was gotten rid of. And that was the beginning of our problems because we were no longer obligated um, to present both sides and to be fair and balanced. And from that, uh, from that moment on, it's just been a slide down. Now, almost everybody who is over the age of 40 today knows who Walter Cronkite is, but I have noticed because news is so topical, a lot of times it doesn't sort of carry over to young, younger generations. So for any students out there and the students in Peter's class, you know, Walter Cronkite covered, uh, he's the one who announced that John F. Kennedy was, was, was dead to the nation. And he, he discussed, he was the first to report the landing of the moon. So really kind of these epical events in U.S. history. Um, but a lot of the students, a lot of Peter's students, um, and one time Dan Rather, as you know, was uh, a mass communication student, and we'll be dealing with some of the technical aspects of the news business. So could you kind of give us um, an overview of what a day looks like? What time do you get to the studio? How do you prepare? What's the makeup like? I think a lot of people don't realize that what goes, what goes into news reporting. So can you kind of uh, give us an idea of that before we turn it over to the students? Okay, well, let Mike, do you want me to tell what covering hard news is like or what being at 60 Minutes is like? Because they're very, very different. Right, give us a little bit of both if you can. Okay. Well, hard news, uh, you, particularly if you're covering the White House, as I did for 10 years, you uh, read everything. And that's the most important. I would say that's still important, but reading absolutely everything, every subject, every newspaper you can get your hands on, every magazine today, I would say every blog, just read everything because you don't want to be caught flat footed when a subject comes up that maybe you've never even heard of. <laughs> uh, so the day starts early reading the newspaper uh, in, in those days in paper form in these days on your iPhone or wherever. Uh, I would go into the White House. Our office was inside the White House. Uh, and I spent all day there uh, in a little booth that was very claustrophobic with two other CBS reporters. Um, and in, those, in the beginning, when I first started covering the White House, which would have been 1976 when Jimmy Carter was president, everything revolved, everything in the government that is, revolved around the evening news. CBS and ABC and NBC evening news are only three places to get news. We were on at 6.30 at night and the whole country watched one of the three. So the White House geared its routine to us because that's the way presidents communicated with the American people. They communicated through the evening news. So, I mean, Pete will tell you this, uh, their day in the White House, all was aiming to get a story that was favorable to them on the evening news. At the White House, they had the same briefings that you see, they weren't televised in those days, but there'd be a morning briefing where the White House would talk to us about what was on their plate, but they were more interested to find out what we were interested in because they wanted to stay ahead of what we were gonna say on the evening news. It was a kind of uh, a cold shower when cable television came along and we at the networks were no longer the center of attention in terms of getting information out because the cables were on all day, 24 hours a day and people in foreign countries could see CNN, for example. So the White House knew that their message could be broadcast around the world 24 hours a day. And so the White House got harder to cover because they, well, we weren't, I wasn't the little princess anymore. Uh, and I, to me, uh, communications and uh, journalism, at least broadcast journalism began to suffer. And today, obviously uh, you get your news instantly, any second of any minute on your iPhone, which I have right here. Uh, it makes being a journalist really hard because the, f the fewer minutes you have to report, the fewer minutes you have to think, to call people, to get opposing views, uh, to become well-rounded as a journalist. Uh, but that's the way it is today. And uh, I guess you have to teach your students 
how how to be generalist so that if something comes at them, uh, they don't sound like an idiot when they go out there to report it. Uh, in terms of makeup, uh, my whole time covering Watergate, I did my own makeup. And uh, that was always difficult as a woman. That was one added step in the day that men didn't have to worry about. And I had to set aside some time during the day to just deal with it. I also would come to work early in the morning, completely made up. I sprayed my hair with cement so I wouldn't have to touch it again. And if there was a windstorm, it didn't move. And, uh, but anyway, that was makeup. 60 minutes is entirely different. And we don't want to go into the details of that, but yeah, that was a day. And of course, as I say, the rhythm of the White House when I started was geared to, to when I would have to run outside where Pete saw me that day, stand outside on the White House lawn and look into the camera and tell the public what had happened today or what the most important thing that happened today. And very often I would report the message that the White House wanted us to report. And often I didn't, often I put in a little bit of information that they weren't happy with. Hey, Mike, could I just jump in here? Yeah. <laughs> just to follow up on something, Leslie, that was very good insights, Leslie. Uh, uh, I want to ask our producer, Wesley Gray, did I send you that photo of me with Leslie? Did I remember to do that? If I did, you can put it up right now because it relates to something she just said. And if I didn't, don't worry about it. What I was going to say, Leslie, was one of the classes I've been teaching here is called The Press and the Presidency. And we talk extensively about the daily briefing. Um, you know, I guess in life, the more things change, the more they're the same. Here we are, all these years later, the briefing has been going on there basically, best I can tell since in the form we see it now, since yep. Eisenhower. And, you know, it hadn't changed all that much. Yeah, the, the transmission forms have changed, but that briefing, right stands up there every day. And so I say to the students, I say, let's explore if there's a better way for reporters to cover the White House than relying on this daily feeding. <laughs> well, it's not the you only. Know, and you of all people know what it was like. I mean, Well, it's not the only time that we interact with the press secretary. We also had an afternoon briefing very often that was in the press secretary's office, no cameras, no large number of people and sometimes just one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one. -on -one. And a lot of the most important information was imparted at that point, which was around four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, anyway, I, I, I have lots in my head that I want to say. <laughs> Go ahead, Mike, <laughs> hit you me. Should, you should write your memoir. I did write my memoir. Well, another one. Called <laughs> Reporting Live. I hope you will. I know, but another one. Oh, well, no, 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 I'm done with that. Okay, Mike. Right. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, well, Leslie, I, we think we've got some, we've got questions from students and they sort of did the research and came up with them independently. So um, there may be, as I said, some that you will keep you on your foot uh, coming from different directions and sometimes circling back around. Uh, but our first one is from Miss Green. Miss Green, do you wanna uh, lead off with your very good question about her career interviewing people? <laughs> Hi, my name is Kamora Green, and I'm a junior at SHSU. I'm from Houston, Texas, and it's really nice to meet you. And I just wanted to ask, who do you think is the most interesting person that you've ever interviewed? Oh, my goodness gracious. I, you know, I, unfortunately, Pete told you how long I've been around. I've interviewed, I must have interviewed thousands of people. And I really honestly can't, I'm asked that question. You're not the first person to ask me. And uh, there, if you, in a way, strangely, in a way, the people who stay with me in my heart are not the leaders, not the presidents or the senators or anything like that. They're people who are out there struggling, um, parents with a sick child, um, a kid with autism, learning how to communicate with an iPad for the first time, you know, the stories of um, courage that I've seen 
in just what you would in, and I would call ordinary people. Uh, and I am, when I say I, I'm privileged to have the job I have, honestly, I'm, I'm not blowing smoke. It's, it's the, the people in the corners of this country tucked away who are, are nervous to even meet a journalist, you know, they, that that's not their lives, who impress me with how they keep going on. Uh, I would think so often, man, if, if that happened to me, I'd get in my closet and never come out. So it's those people, and I've just met su such extraordinary human beings in my career. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, Ms. Green. Um, now, do we have Nicholas with us here today? I don't see his name on the participants. Um, Peter, do you know? Uh, he should be, but if he's not on there, he's not on there. Let's uh, circle back to Nicholas if he, um, if we can find him. Uh, but Ms. Moffitt, Savannah, you've got kind of a different question for Ms. Stahl. Do you want to fire away? Hello, my name is Savannah Moffitt. I'm from Houston, Texas, and I'm a senior um, at Sam Houston State University. Um, and my questions are a little different, but they're kind of, they just are personable. Um, so my first question that I wanted to ask was, how um, did you hear about and get casted in the role for Madagascar um, Escape to Africa? <laughs> is that your first question? Yes. <laughs> Is, well, you know what? They called me up out of the blue. They wanted a reporter and they called me and I had to go get permission to do it. Uh, but my bosses were very kind because I wanted to do it because I knew it would be fun. And I was hoping that at some point in my life I'd had grandchildren who would see it. And that is exactly what happened. And it was really fun. I mean, what a fun question. <laughs> now that came out of nowhere. It, but it reminded me of my nephews because they watched that movie a lot. So, yeah. I was to know. Um, am I able to ask my second question or no? I'm happy. Come on, hit me. Go ahead. <laughs> um, well, my second question was how did your history degree encourage your career pathway into television broadcast? Um, this is uh, now I'm going to answer you in just as uh, a surprising way as your first question was for me. Um, after college, where I did major in history, uh, I wanted to be a doctor, and I went to uh, I went to a graduate school to take science courses that I hadn't taken in college, and one of them was um, a comparative anatomy, and I remember they wanted me to touch a sheep's heart, and they gave me my own dogfish shark, and I wouldn't touch them, and the professor said to me, Miss Stahl, if you don't touch them, how are you ever going to be a doctor? And I realized I wasn't ever going to be a doctor because <laughs> I wouldn't touch anything icky. So I then answered a job in the New York Times. And the job said researcher. And I got a job uh, working on the mayor of New York speeches. And it went back to what I had done as a history major, which was reading and researching and I loved it. I loved it. And I was so happy. Um, but one day I walked into the newsroom that was right next to the mayor's office and I met a reporter. No one had ever talked to me about journalism ever. Um, and I said, what do you do? What do you do all day? And when he finished telling me what he did all day, I said, wow, who knew there was a job like that? And I, I knew right from that conversation that this is what I had to do. So there it is. What the? <laughs> Those are great questions, Savannah. Thank you very much. And Leslie, just kind of following up with uh, Savannah's first question, Nicholas, who's not here, but what he wanted to know, uh, which is similar to the Madagascar question is, how did you get cast on Frasier? <laughs> I love it. I claim fans. claims to fame. I've had <laughs> heads of state walk out on me and slam me, and I've interviewed all the presidents, and people want to know how I got on these fun shows. It was the same thing. They just called me out of the blue, and I wanted to do it. I just did one with Jim Carrey that's on television now. Um, 
those are, those are the things that I love because they're so unexpected for me to do and for the audience to see. Um, I, can I veer off and say some things that I wanted to say? Absolutely. Okay. Sure. So I'm watching, and this is current events. I'm watching what's happening uh, at the White House with the president and the difficulty reporters are having finding out the truth about his condition. And I'm reminded of the day Ronald Reagan was shot. And I was covering the White House that day. And the White House lied to us about how severely President Reagan had been shot. I mean, how, how precarious his life was. It was hanging. I mean, it was, he was going to die. And they kept telling us he was fine, he was okay, there's no problem, he's telling jokes with the doctors. Um, and actually, it took years before the public and the people who had covered the president in those days found out um, just how serious his injury and the wound was. And I, I'm watching what's going on and my mind is fl flying back to those couple of days in the beginning when he was first shot. Leslie, if I might just jump in there, I was called by, when this all happened over the weekend, I was called by the news director of a local station in Houston. And he said, he basically asked me, he said, what do you think is the most important thing about this story right now? And I said one word, credibility. Yep. And it's it all begins idea. there. So It's uh, so unsettling. I mean, the problem is that they may be telling the truth, but you don't know. And that's what you're talking about, you know. Would you please insert, too, that you can say that I never lied to you? <laughs> Pete never lied to me. That is Well, as far as I know, Pete. <laughs> Good. You, you know, either never lied or was, or was the best at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one or the other. <laughs> um, and, and Leslie, you know, of course, the, the classic case of that, it's not modern, but uh, Woodrow Wilson, uh, after his stroke, when he was giving his whirlwind tour, um, there was no access to him at all. Uh, the advisors would go in and they would either talk to Colonel House or uh, Woodrow Wilson's wife. And they, they, one of them would come back and say, the president has decided. Okay. And, they, and no one has any idea if Woodrow Wilson decided that, if he was capable of deciding it, or if one of his intermediaries decided it and said it in his name. So it's, there's a long history of that. It's very interesting. Absolutely. And, and they lied to us, they when John Kennedy was president because he had Addison's disease and they never told the public. So, I mean, there's kind of a history of this with the presidency. And I think I read with John Kennedy that there were days that he got 36 different shots. Yeah. His doctor that they called, you know, Dr. Feelgood uh, would, would give him up to 36 different shots, including some that mess with, you know, your cognitive abilities and, and, and other aspects of, of your brain. So it's, the modern government, really Watergate, I think, helped undercover a, a, a new, well, uncover a world in which that sort of thing was unacceptable. Wow. It still, it still happened. <laughs> it's at still least judge is unacceptable. <laughs> right. But let's see, we've got a, a, a great question from Danielle Garza, um, and, and, it, and it speaks to this issue of, of transparency in government. So Danielle, can, can you fire away? Hello. Hi, Danielle. Danielle Garza, and I'm a senior at SHSU, and I'm from Spring, Texas. And my question is, what was it like for you to cover the Watergate scandal? Well, that was my first job at CBS, and my first real job learning how to call uh, sources and investigate. And it was my start. And it happened by accident that I got to even cover that story. When it started, it was just a break-in at an office. It happened to be the office of the Democratic Party, but it was for a long time in the very beginning thought to be no more than a burglary. And because it was the Democratic Party, my office decided to send me. I was brand new, brand new. I just walked in the door mm -hmm. and I was what we called an affirmative action hire because in those days, uh, similar in, in some ways to what's going on now, there was this big move to diversify newsrooms and they didn't have any women. So they hired me and Connie Chung and Bernie Shaw. And the three of us were the new kids. We were really apprenticed. Uh, we really weren't full, 
full-fledged reporters, but they sent me to cover the arraignment of the burglars. And that's how I started on the story. Uh, and as I say, that's where I learned how to be a serious investigator and go and stand on people's doorsteps and push without being obnoxious, although I, they probably did think I was obnoxious. I thought I wasn't being, uh, just to get behind the story and get people to trust you enough to tell you something and believe that you wouldn't never tell anybody where you got the information. Um, it went on for years, Watergate. Uh, and um, I don't know that there's ever been a story since that has quite, has been for reporters anyway, as important in terms of our federal government. I was very lucky to be able to start there. Um, Did I answer you? Thank you. Okay. And we have another one that comes, uh, actually follows up on, on how you introduced your question, Leslie, and it's from Michaela Hubert. Uh, go ahead, Michaela. There's Michaela. Hi. Um, sorry. <laughs> uh, my name is Jalen Garcia, and I am a senior here at Sam Houston. Um, speaking to the hire during affirmative action. Can you tell us about what it was like overcoming sexism in your field? Well, I will tell you that when I was hired, affirmative action was extremely popular. It wasn't like now. A lot of people think we should get rid of affirmative action, but in those days, everybody was for it. Um, my boss at CBS News was devoted to the program and determined that the three of us in his bureau were going to succeed, and we all did. Um, we, as I said, we were apprenticed to the senior correspondents. It, the whole system was perfect. Today, you're hired, whether it's affirmative action or not, and you're just thrown in, and it's sink or swim. In those days, we were allowed to follow the senior uh, reporters around and learn by observing what they did. That's how I learned to. How, how to talk to a source by observing the senior people. Uh, it's terrible that that apprentice system in every field is gone because it is, it's not being an intern. You're actually hired and they pay you, uh, but, but they're training you. You're a trainee. Uh, so it, it worked for me because my boss, the guy at the very top of the pyramid said to everybody, we're going to make this work. We're going to bring these young people along and they are not going to fail. So I was very lucky to have a boss like that and the program too. It That's would be amazing. nice to have the same thing today. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Jalen, what about you? You had a second question there, didn't you? I did. Um, in an interview, you once said, I would have definitely had a position within my heart, and those are the most difficult stories to cover. Could you tell us about a story you covered where your personal bias made it difficult to stay neutral? Um, well, one thing comes to mind immediately, uh, and it wasn't a personal bias as much as knowing somebody was lying to me. And being on live television and not knowing how to handle it because I got angry. Uh, my emotions were anger. And I was on television. It was the, the camera was right in my face and everybody could see I was angry. And no matter what I said, the person just kept saying, no, that's not true, but it was true. And to this day, to this minute, I still don't know how, how to deal with somebody who's looking you straight in the eye and lying to you. I even trying to describe it to you. I don't know how I could have handled it differently. So that was a moment when my emotions, frankly, got the better of me. I'm pretty trained now to be able to deal with my biases. And, uh, but that took, you know, I've been around a long time. And uh, when I started, I think I've already told you about the fairness doctrine. It was just absolutely part of the job. It wasn't, you, there was no question that you were going to be fair and balanced, period. 
It was the job. So we all had to learn to be objective. Here's what's happened now. You have all these cable outlets and they are, they wear, they wear their political biases on their sleeves as a badge of honor. So you know that Fox is gonna be conservative and MSNBC is gonna be liberal. You watch them knowing that. And so the public, because of that, gets to believe that we're all biased because they are biased. It's not, you know, they, they are. And it's the system because there's so many different stations. Each one can uh, afford to be political. Um, those of us who came up the old way and still work for outfits that try to be fair and balanced um, suffer because we have that reputation, I think, from the fact that there are so many reporters out there who take a position, political position, and they do it proudly. Um, Anyway, I, for me, and I'm perhaps old fashioned, I don't know, uh, I miss the old way a lot. But I also like watching. I like watching the, the different views come out. I enjoy that too. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Jay Lynn. And I apologize, I skipped over your name and looking through the questions. So those were excellent questions and I apologize for not giving you the appropriate in introduction. But but Leslie, you know, as, as Jalen just noted, and as our next question, who is actually Michaela, um, eight of the 10 students in this class are female. I was and noticing it, that. How it interesting. Is a, it is a trend across the university. 80% of the university's honors students are female. And so we... we These are my just, muscles. <laughs> and so they're experiencing a different world in terms of who they interact with a critical mass than you experienced when you broke in. But there, that is one of the things that we see a great interest in as Michaela's question will uh, attest to. Go ahead, Michaela. Hi, my name is Michaela Hubert. I'm a senior mass communications major student and I'm from Houston, Texas. So my question for you is, can you reflect on how it was being a mother and having a career within journalism? Oh, I can. <laughs> um, first off, I was very fortunate to have a mother, my mother, who never made me feel guilty that I was going to the office. She wanted me to have a career. She didn't have one. And she, I think, felt that it, it, when she got older that she had suffered from that because she was bored. Uh, so she pushed me into my career. And I remember her saying to me when I was in my mid-30s, she said, you have to have a child. I said, well, I can't because I have this career and I'm devoted to it. She said, you can do both. I said, no, I can't. She said, yes, you can. You can do both. Now, my mother was in my corner. She didn't live near me, so she actually didn't help me. She said she would help me, but she didn't help me. But <laughs> uh, I think that a, a big problem women have outside of money is that they, they've, they're getting sideward glances. How could you leave your children? Um, and I'm gonna be like my mother and say, you can, and children will be fine. They'll just be fine. Uh, the bigger problem today, I think, is making ends meet. You don't wanna leave your child with people you don't, you, you don't trust, and childcare is expensive, and that becomes the biggest problem. Uh, and you know, I can't answer that one. I really can't answer that one. We are a country that doesn't provide daycare. Now, this could end up sounding like I'm biased, but I think there should be health care so that all people can go to work. Um, there are single fathers too. So I'm not sure that this is a gender related issue. Uh, it's an issue so that our next generation will be healthy mentally, physically. Uh, I don't understand why people aren't thinking about the next generation in those terms. So uh, anyway, it's, it's, it's difficult. It wasn't difficult for me. I had, my husband is a writer 
and he was home and that made a difference. And my mother did really help me by bucking me up and saying, you can do both. Uh, but I'm not going to tell you it's easy. I'm not. Uh, but it worked out for me. Thank you so a, much. I wrote a book called Reporting Live. And it was about my career in those days when my, my daughter was born and when she was a toddler. And I write a lot about the difficulties uh, when she was sick or when, uh, you know, how I just kept these lists to make sure that I didn't forget to make sure she got to the dentist and things like that. So uh, you can pick that up. You can probably get it for 19 cents today. Who's <laughs> that old? <laughs> and Leslie, you were actually on Murphy Brown, I think, uh, not to bring this TV stuff back in, but that was the she and Mary Tyler Moore were kind of uh, trailblazers in terms of presenting female, uh, single females on television, trying to juggle different ba and balance different. No, but they weren't mothers. And right. so that, you know, even the women's movement, uh, which really helped all women come into the workplace, didn't really talk about motherhood. And the question that I was just asked, how do you do it both? Uh, it was very difficult. I, the women's movement kind of ignored that side of things. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your perspective. Very good question, very good answer. And um, now, now, Leslie, this is a mass comm class, but um, when Peter is in a good mood, he will allow one political scientist into his class. And <laughs> so our next student is, is a political scientist. She's our token political scientist. <laughs> And so she may have a, a, a question from a slightly different angle. Meredith, would you like to join us? Meredith, are you there? If, are we just not hearing you? Well, let's, um, maybe we can go to Heather and we will uh, come back to Meredith when we get this figured out. Uh, Heather has a couple of related. I am oh, so sorry about that. I'm Meredith back. comes back in. My computer literally shut down the second you said political science major. So, see, she she doesn't have those technical skills they teach in those math <laughs> classes. She's struggling with Zoom. <laughs> but she knows the politics. So, so Meredith, fire away. Hi, Mrs. Stahl. It's nice to meet you. Same. Um, the question that I had for you was. From a, from a journalist standpoint, I was wondering what kind of harmful um, consequences can come from the term fake news? Oh, very harmful. Very, very harmful. Uh, I think that since President Trump has come after us, mm -hmm. uh, our credibility, trustworthiness has declined enormously. We see the kind of curve go down. Um, I don't know how many of you have read this because it, it did become public, but he I asked him once uh, why he keeps calling us fake news and why mm -hmm. he attacks us so repeatedly. This was during the campaign in, in 2016. Every time he had a chance, every time a camera was mm -hmm. on, he was attacking us. And he said to me, I'll tell you why, because I do it so that when you're negative about me, people won't mm -hmm. believe you. Mm -hmm. People won't believe you. So that's what, that's the point. He doesn't want people to believe us when we're negative, <clears throat> but the repetition, the constant repetition to answer your question has been very detrimental to us. Mm -hmm. I can't, I can't sugarcoat that one. Yeah. And um, another question that I had was, due to you previously contracting COVID and thankfully recovering, um, I was wondering how it felt personally to hear President Trump downplay it so much. Well, you know, first of all, I, I really can't comment on the trajectory of his getting it because uh -huh. everybody's different. Uh -huh. I got it from my husband. He had an extremely mild case. He slept for two days and then it was gone. I had a terrible case, terrible. He had difficulty recovering. I didn't. 
Mm -hmm. so no two cases are the same. He's also taking the president cutting edge medications yes. and they may be shortening things. I, I really can't comment on what he's gone through. I could tell, I can tell you, I was in the hospital for three days. Mm -hmm. um, I also had very low oxygen. I got pneumonia. When he bounded up those stairs yesterday, mm -hmm. after three days in the hospital, I, I could not even walk 10 feet without being exhausted. So that was my trajectory. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's very difficult for me to stand back and judge what he's going through. Um, I, had a I had a difficult time, but I bounced back quickly. So here we go. Thank you for answering my questions. Pleasure. Pleasure. This is fun. Leslie, and you mentioned, you know, just the fake news. Um, I was talking to a former um, State Department official last month, and he told me that on COVID, um, what the Russian foreign intelligence is doing is sending out fake messages on social media. And half of them are saying COVID's a hoax. Half of them are saying COVID is the most scary thing ever. And what they know is, is that in a democracy, if people get confused about what the facts are, then it just sort of shuts down. They get confused and, and they go with their biases instead of knowledge. And that's really what the, the concept of, of fake news, spreading that message of fake news does, it really undercuts the very um, foundation of what the United States is, is based on, a free media and people making informed choices. So thank you for, for answering and, and really going to that point. Democracy is a, a, a free, trusted press is absolutely essential, essential to a, a thriving democracy. We just, a, one function is to clean out, clean out uh, leadership that, that's corrupt or whatever. And if we are not free to do that job, reporting on the government, holding officials uh, responsible and asking them to tell us what is going on, even if it's a source who's not supposed to talk to you. This is our function. and. We have been, for all these years, relatively, relatively free of corruption because of this. So it's heartbreaking. Well, Leslie, earlier you were asked what your favorite story of all time was, and Heather Inman has a somewhat related but distinct question. So Heather, can thank you for being flexible, by the way, Heather. And can you um, go ahead and ask your, your good question with potential follow-up? Yes. Hi, Mrs. Stahl. My name is Heather Inman, and I'm a junior at SAM, and I'm from Houston, Texas. And my question is, which president was your favorite to interview and why? Well, to interview, I will tell you my favorite president. Can I do that? Mm -hmm. uh, George Herbert Walker Bush is my favorite president. I covered Jimmy Carter, Ronald Reagan. And, uh, and Bush and a little bit of, um, of President Ford. But George Herbert Walker Bush, I thought, was a man of great integrity. And I respected him. His presidency has not gotten its due. Um, I think eventually it will. It was, it's, it's hard to be a one-term president. It's easier to be a two-term because over eight years you can get more done and uh, history has more to chew on. Uh, but he, one of the great things he did was the Berlin Wall came down and Europe didn't come apart and there wasn't a war. And George Bush being modest is I think a huge part of why that part of our history was saved. I mean, the Russians could have just ignited that situation. He, he managed to control it brilliantly. Um, and he was sane. He was a, a great role, role model for the country. Uh, so he was my favorite president that I knew personally and covered. He also had a fantastic sense of humor. It was kind of an impish, a little bit silly, you know, and uh, he, he was enormously likable. Uh, and serious, serious about the world. 
and the issues that he was responsible for. And so even as a reporter, and this is hard to say, I really respected him. Uh, often White House reporters don't really respect the men they're covering. That's true. Because we see, we hear too much from people who want to criticize. Um, but he was my favorite. To interview is a different question. I don't know. I, I have to chew on that one. Jimmy Carter was the one who was the most involved with issues. So you could ask him a question and, and he could give you the most precise answers. Ronald Reagan was a little more evasive. Um, I'm not so sure, I don't know. Don't know. Leslie, that's a good lesson for the mass comm students because oftentimes the presidents who are the most knowledgeable about specific issues may not be the most effective politically. Right, and that's a, Jimmy Carter is a great example of that, yeah. And his training was nuclear engineering, and I mean, he was a nuclear engineer, so he had to know details. Reagan was an actor. <laughs> right. And, and it just tells you a lot about how they actually approached the presidency, and, and interestingly, which one was you know, probably more successful. Heather, did you want to follow that up at all? Um, yes, I was also going to ask um, the difference between um, Nixon and Reagan and their personalities. Oh my gosh, you couldn't find two people who are more polar opposite. Completely. You know, I actually got a question off to Nixon. I'll tell you this one real fast if I can make it fast. It was the height of Watergate and he didn't want his uh, aides to go up to Congress and testify. There were all kinds of hearings going on. And so he invoked something called executive privilege. He had not been asked about it in any kind of a, a news you know, any, any, no reporters had had an opportunity to ask. Now, I told you he hated Dan Rather. So Dan went out to lunch and I was sent to the White House to sit in for Dan while he was at lunch. There's something called a lid that White House has put on to assure reporters that nothing's going to happen. There's a lid on. Not, well, of course, the minute Dan left the White House, they took the lid off. President comes into the briefing room and he hold, held a news conference. And I raised my hand, I asked him about executive privilege. As I told you, there were very few women reporters in those days. He'd never seen me before. He called on me and then he patronized me. He put me down terribly. It was a, a, an answer, you know, how would you know to ask a question like that? Uh, don't you know this and that and that and this? He just made me feel about that tall and I wanted to creep away. Two weeks later, Dan Rather goes to lunch. I'm sent to the White House. <laughs> the president comes into the briefing room again, and guess what? He apologized to me. Richard Nixon apologized for treating me that way. So I have a little bit of warmth in my heart for him for that. Uh, but he was very awkward with people he was suspicious. He, he was vulgar, as it turned out, um, because we have the white, his tapes of, from, the Oval, from the Oval Office. Uh, he was suspicious of everybody. He was a little bit corrupt. Ronald Reagan, and, and you don't often hear this word from describe, uh, describing a man, but he was sweet. He had a sweetness about him. And I think he was honest. And I think the public, on top of everything else, just simply liked him. And they didn't like Nixon at all. Something comes through about a person's essence, the fundamental temperament and personality. It just comes through, whether it's in the television age or not. And likability is a huge factor in leadership. And I think it was a enormous part of why Reagan was an effective president. He also had a wonderful sense of humor, which Richard Nixon did not. And that helps too. That's a great answer. And you know, um, just some, some interesting uh, concepts. The, when the White House transcripts were published, you know, the, they didn't publish the curse words. And that's for the young people, that was where the phrase expletive deleted comes from. You never see that anymore because they don't delete the expletives. <laughs> right. 
if you read Bob Woodward's new book, you know exactly what you don't. You don't have to guess which curse word Donald Trump is using. They're in the book. So good, good what, question. What was, so funny, what was so funny about the transcript you're talking about was that almost every other word was ex expletive deleted. I mean, it's hilariously funny just to look through it to see how often he swore. <laughs> Nixon. And then Mary, I think Miss um, Stahl. Uh, maybe was responsive to your first question earlier when she discussed her college. Can you um, ask the second question about new journalists? That's an excellent question, especially for this audience. Hi, Mrs. Saul. It's nice to meet you. Um, I'm Mary. I'm a senior here at SAM. Um, my question is for new journalists in a beginning career, what would be your best advice? Well, it's the first thing I said when I was asked, what, it, what do you do all day? And that's read everything, read everything. It doesn't matter whether it's way off the news. It doesn't matter if it's about an issue you don't care about. Just read everything. Get the newspaper or pick up your iPhone and read all the way through the stories. Don't just read the first paragraph. Um, I think if you educate yourself that way in depth, in depth, um, somehow, I don't know how that comes across, but confidence in you will just ooze out of, people will feel that confidence that you have and will have confidence in you. And I always tell kids when I go to speak at colleges um, that that is lesson one and it's lesson two as well. Read everything. I, I, you know, sometimes, even if you're not a reader, once you get into the habit of this, uh, it, it becomes pleasurable. Mm -hmm. Can I add a little um, question to that? Sure. Um, I kind of started reading the Washington Post. Would you recommend, because you're saying like read everything, would you recommend, because I feel like some kind of have biases. So like I understand what you mean by read everything. Would you recommend anything to read? Well, I'll tell you what I read every okay. day because I got in the habit when I covered the White House. So I read the Washington Post every day. They're an excellent newspaper. Um, I read the New York Times, accused of bias all the time. And I read the Wall Street Journal, also accused of bias on the other end of it. So I read those three newspapers every week. I read the New Yorker, which I think is a wonderful magazine. I still read Time Magazine. A lot of people don't, but um, it's, it's terrific magazine. Um, and, uh, I read the, well, I stopped reading the new Republic. I used to read it. Um, uh, and then anything else I pick up, I like to read biographies, particularly of leaders. Um, and every now and then, if I'm really, really, really lucky, I get to read a novel, <laughs> a mystery, a really easy to digest mystery. Leslie, what's your favorite mystery? I, I like John Grisham a lot. Um, oh, what's the book? The Crawdads. That book is so good. Where the, Where the Crawdads Sing, I think it's called. That's a mystery, and it was spectacular. It's been on the bestseller list for 100 weeks. Absolutely. It's great that you get some um, escape time. And, yeah, and exactly. We've got a, a last question here from Cody. So you, you've touched on the importance of students having um, knowledge and really getting a foundation of knowledge. And I think Cody's question uh, speaks to, uh, and Cody, I think since she already spoke to COVID, maybe you can close with your last question on, on composure and objectivity. Um, I actually did not ask my question about COVID just yet. Uh, would you like me to ask that first or? E either, either way. Okay, so uh, I'll see if I can fit both in here then. Um, hi, Leslie. Uh, how are you doing? I see uh, your name's Cody Obi, like Obi Wan. Yeah, I, I go by Obi. Uh, I'm from an Indian reservation in North Carolina. Uh, ah. I'm a mass comm major at Sam Houston. Um, and my first question, I guess, um, is after battling coronavirus yourself, how do you feel personally about everything opening back up? and society be becoming more relaxed to the idea of always wearing face masks and staying six feet apart. Right. Um, I'm, I believe, not because I had COVID, 
but just believe as an observer. And because I listened to the CDC, the head of the CDC who said this, if everybody wore a mask, we would get rid of this thing. So that the idea that masks are hurting the country, they would help, they would get us, uh, they would allow for people to come back to work. They would allow for us to send our kids back to school. Uh, so I think we may never get back to normal where we're not wearing masks, or maybe eventually we will, but I mean for maybe years. But if that's the price to pay to get us back into our lives, why not pay it? It seems like such a small thing. I'm desperate to get back to my life. I'm, I'm up here in my apartment. Can you see that little red thing behind me? You know what that is? Yes. That is a recording studio that I built um, under instruction from my office so that I can record my stories from here because I'm basically always in lockdown like everybody else. So I say wear your mask so that I can go back to work. Wear your mask so my grandchildren can go back to school. It's, it's not a big thing. I don't like wearing a mask, I hate it, but if that's, it, if that's all it takes to get back to our routines, back to being with our friends and our colleagues, back to actually being in an office together, Come on, it's, it's, a, it's not a big deal. And I feel very safe because I have antibodies. <laughs> so I'm, and I'm tested all the time. Oh my goodness. My nose is all the time sore. Mm. What's your other question? Um, I, I, my other question was actually gonna relate to something that was already asked earlier. So I guess it's best not to worry. All my questions have been answered. Great, great. Well, thank you, Cody um, and Miss Stahl. Wonderful. Peter, would you like to close us out? And, and, and Peter, just thank you for bringing in such wonderful guests and, and for allowing your students, your great students, to participate. Uh, Can I say something? Can I say something? Sure. First of all, great questions. Um, and I want to thank the students for coming up with them. Uh, I do things like this often, and uh, these were some of the best. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, Leslie. Um, and Mike, thank you for being here because I know you have a class you have to go teach. I'm going to duck out and go teach class. Thank you very much, Ms. Hey, Mike. Thank you. Uh, so I will just, um, we're about seven minutes over what I, <clears throat> excuse me, what I promised you we'd be, Leslie, but the way you get people to respond to you is being good to your word. So I'm doing my best to be good to my word. Yeah, we started there. <laughs> and so I have credibility with you. Um, but let me just say in concluding, first of all, please give Aaron my regards, your husband. And for the benefit of the students, they, many of them may not know this, he, uh, Leslie's husband wrote the, the movie Urban Cowboy, which was filmed in Houston and starred John Travolta and it was a big hit. <laughs> it's yeah. still on television. Oh, I see it yeah, periodically, yeah. yes. And you know something, I always watch it. Me too. You know, <laughs> I thought that's going to come out, yeah. Uh, um, so, and Aaron's probably forgotten, he actually interviewed me when I was in the Ford White House. He was doing a story for the New Yorker, as I recall. I'll take it back, it was New York Magazine. Right, he was with New York Magazine. Yes, and I, I've got it here somewhere, and I remember you didn't think I was very responsive, probably, but uh, probably wasn't. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I just want to say thank you so much. You had so many insights to offer here today that... They, they would benefit not only a student, certainly, but just human beings and society and people to hear some of the things you're offering. And it means a lot to me that you've taken time to do this, especially what you, in light of what you recently have gone through. Oh, uh, no, I'm, I'm absolutely fine. Thank you. But it, for me, uh, it was a lot of fun. And, me too. Uh, it, me brought too. Back, it brought back a lot of great memories. And... Uh, it just it means a lot to me that you would do this. So I'm, I'll close by saying I'm working on two projects. One is my memoir, which I may have to call you at some point to get a little anytime, anytime. memory. A little, did we really do that? Right. <laughs> a little bit of that. And I'm actually they I wrote a novel that they adapted as a play at Sam Houston, which Ooh. it's all about the press covering the White House. You you would know the subject matter very well. And well, then you have to send it to me. 
Well, I'm working with a very talented uh, composer at Sam Houston right now named Kyle Kindred, and we're doing a musical version of it. So hopefully one of these days, maybe you'll get to see it. Maybe it'll be on Broadway. Well, right I don't know about that, it. but <laughs> <laughs> Leslie, is there any last comments you'd like to make? And no, I just want to say it's uh, great to see you again. Uh, and as I said, I wanted to end my, what I was saying by thanking the students for their good questions. Well, we all appreciate it, and you take care of yourself. Uh, Thank you, you too. We need Wear your mask. Well, well yeah, we need the Leslie Stalls of the world, so keep at it, and, and we'll see you soon again, I hope. I hope. Thank you.